Today's show is brought to you by Squarespace. Start building your website today at squarespace.com. Enter offer code UNIVERSE at checkout and get 10% off. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. And by Audible. Audible has over 180,000 audiobooks and spoken word audio products. Get a free 30-day trial at audible.com slash universe. A few years ago, I was coming back from the Middle East with Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan, and Jim Lovell, the first man on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The last man on the moon. Remind me to dust my camera too, will you? And the commander of Apollo 13. Oh, you can leave that Apollo. I was part of a morale tour of military bases, and it's safe to say our accommodations were not five-star. We spent most of our nights in military barracks, including one night on an aircraft carrier in the Arabian Sea, and flew from place to place aboard a KC-135 tanker jet. There were only about a dozen narrow seats in the massive plane, and there were many dozens of passengers. The astronauts got first dibs on the seats, most of the rest of us just found a place to sit on narrow benches or atop piles of cargo. On one especially long leg of the journey, I happened to snag a seat and began buckling in. I looked to my left, Armstrong. I looked to my right, Cernan. And it occurred to me that this is exactly what it would have felt like 40 years earlier if the three of us had been strapping into an Apollo command module on our way to the moon. I sat very happily with that thought for a moment, completely unconcerned by the fact that I'm a fully grown man and I was playing rocket ship. And you know what? I don't care who knows it. Space has a way of making goofy dreamers of all of us. As children, we live in a world populated by dragons and princesses and unicorns and wizarding schools, and one by one, the hard hand of reality takes them all away from us but space remains. Just outside the thin skin of our atmosphere is a trackless place where time is elastic, distance is unlimited. The very laws of physics seem to come unhinged. I came to a deep love of space early, very early. The first memory to which I can affix a date was October 4, 1957, when I was just three years old, standing on the front lawn of my family's home with my older brother and our parents, scanning the sky for Sputnik, the first satellite. We had no idea if we could spot it, no idea if a machine that was actually moving through space could be troubled to fly over a quiet block in suburban Baltimore and were simultaneously thrilled and deliciously frightened at the possibility that it might be. Eventually, our parents gave up, pointed to the blinking lights of a passing commuter plane, and told their young sons that yes, that was Sputnik, and now it was time to go to bed. But their young sons, or at least this young son, got hooked. I was consumed by the manned Mercury flights and Gemini flights and the grand and glorious Apollo lunar flights that followed, as well as the extraordinary adventures of the shuttles and space stations, to say nothing of the unmanned probes that have ranged through the solar system and even beyond for the past half century. I've written stories of those and other missions over 30 years as a science journalist, in the pages of Time magazine, mostly, as well as in numerous books, including Apollo 13, which became the basis of the 1995 movie. It's a journey I plan to continue, and it's one I hope you'll share in Time's podcast series, It's Your Universe. The massive amount of websites on the Internet can be compared to the amount of visible stars in the universe. For some, we know they exist, but others are out of visibility. 
Don't let your website fade into the background. Stand out with Squarespace. With their easy-to-use features and customizable designs, Squarespace will help you build the website of your dreams. One of the best things about Squarespace is that you don't have to know how to code. They give you the tools to build a site that looks professionally designed regardless of skill level. Plus, you get a free domain if you sign up for a year. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code UNIVERSE to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. Today's episode is also sponsored by Audible.com. We live in a hectic world, and rushing through work, school, chores, and errands seems like the norm. Keep up with your entertainment on the go with Audible. Audible has more than 180,000 audiobooks and spoken word audio products. You can listen anywhere by using your smartphone, computer, or tablet. Moonshot, the inside story of man's greatest adventure by Dan Parry, is just one of their many titles. From the personal tragedies and triumphs the astronauts encountered along the way to the mission's terrifying climax, Moonshot tells the complete and compelling story of the 1969 moon landing. Find this book or other books of all genres at audible.com. As a special offer to my listeners, you can get a free 30-day trial today by signing up at audible.com slash universe. That's audible.com slash universe. There's a reason so many of us are so hopelessly, willingly hooked on space. Human beings have always seen the universe in a geocentric way. There's the down here-ness of Earth and the out there-ness of everything else. And that binary divide is one we could abide, except that we can always see the everything else. That same film of atmosphere that keeps us safe also affords us a permanent window on a cosmos that is entirely and yet irresistibly out of our reach. We're like fish born into one of the grandest, loveliest aquariums imaginable. It's a wondrous habitat, but we're trapped there all the same. Meantime, just beyond the wall of glass in front of us, we see the unexplored room in which our little world is held. We see a hallway that turns and then vanishes, leading who knows where. We see across the room, a window, and through a gap in the drapes we see grass and trees and sky and clouds, and we can never, ever touch them, or at least most of us can't. But 50 years ago, we learned how to seal a lucky few of our own inside small metal pods and send them out to explore the void. The first Americans to make that trip, Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom, didn't even orbit the Earth. They simply climbed high enough to punch through the atmospheric film, then arced back over and plunged back down after less than five minutes in what we call space. But that was enough. Like the first whales to breach the surface of the ocean and feel only air around them, they had touched the thereness. In all of the years since, hundreds of human beings have orbited the Earth, usually about 220 miles high, or roughly the distance from Washington, D.C. to New York. We went to the moon nine magnificent times, in the process blowing the doors off our distance records. Even then, though, there was a sweet smallness to the thing. During Apollo 11, the first lunar landing, Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were outside their spacecraft exploring the lunar surface for no more than two and a half hours. And in all that time, they didn't travel very far. If the landing site were a baseball stadium and the lunar module touched down on the pitcher's mound, the astronauts barely got out of the infield. Still, the return of the Apollo 11 crew was even more triumphant than the return of the first humans in space, mostly because they brought back pieces of where they'd been. 
47 pounds of rocks that seemed entirely indistinguishable from the commonplace stuff of Earth, but that were in fact transcendently different simply because of their origin. That is the secret intoxicating joy of space. There are few sights more dispiriting than the spectacle of NASA administrators testifying before Congress, trying to justify the money spent on space travel. The officials will talk about weather satellites and industrial spin-offs and national security applications, and every single one of those things is absolutely true. Every single one is also a lie. You don't travel to Europe or Asia or the splendid stretches of Africa just for the pictures you'll take or the snow globes you'll buy. And you surely don't travel there because there's some practical spin-off to the experience. You go there for the thereness, to be in the alien place, to see the alien sights, to hear the sounds, smell the smells, taste the foods. To the people who live in those novel lands, it's nothing. But to you who flew across an ocean to get there, the whole point of the journey is the journey. And when you come home, no one can ever take away from you the fact that you've been there. In 1997, I was visiting the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California and was taken to see the Cassini spacecraft, which was then being prepared for its launch to Saturn later that year. I was allowed nowhere near the ship, but instead looked down on it from a catwalk above, behind a thick pane of bulletproof glass. The technicians below were masked and gloved and swaddled like surgeons, tending to the ship which was pinned to the floor by the same gravity that holds us all fast. Seven years later, that same machine, a terrestrial assemblage of metal and plastic and silicon, having long since shrugged off Earth's gravity, was 746 million miles from its Pasadena birthplace, slaloming through Saturn's system of moons and rings. It had covered the distance from here to there and become, in effect, a creature of there. I may never have touched the ship, but other people did and in so doing, they became a part of the going. All over the solar system, earthly spores like Cassini are ranging free. In the past year, active space probes, most of them American, have been approaching or orbiting or on the surface of Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto, and the asteroid Cirrus. Voyagers 1 and 2, which were launched to the outer planets in 1977, are currently 12.4 billion and 10.1 billion miles away from Earth. Voyager 1 has now left the solar system altogether, becoming the first human-built machine to enter the deep blue waters of interstellar space. Bolted to the sides of both spacecraft, are their celebrated golden records, analog disks etched with the sights and sounds of Earth. If any intelligent species found the disks, they'd have to gin up a way to play them with a turntable, since that was the state of human technology when the ships left Earth. But if they did play them, they would see pictures of dolphins and cities and snow caps. They'd hear the voices of children and the sounds of birds. They'd hear Bach and Mozart and Beethoven, as well as Peruvian panpipes and Louis Armstrong, and Chuck Berry performing Johnny B. Good. And they might well say, who cares? But the answer is, we care. This is who we are. This is where we live. This is how we sound. This is what we sing. There's joy in being able to communicate that to the universe and pride in the fact that we were the ones who sent the message out there. The aliens didn't have to come find us. That, in the end, is what the NASA administrator speaking to Congress can never say. We go to space for the same reason we dance and sing and paint paintings and write symphonies. 
None of those things does anything at all to feed us or heal us or keep us alive. But every single one of them is a reason we take such joy in being alive in the first place. I was surprised that Neil Armstrong ever agreed to go on that Middle East tour in 2010. He never cared for meet and greets, especially since that's all anybody seemed to want him to do after he returned from the moon in 1969. But for the military, he'd make an exception. During one of the astronauts' appearances, before an audience of people young enough to be their grandchildren, one serviceman raised his hand and asked Armstrong to say the words. But Armstrong just smiled and reached for the mic. His hand was shaky and his voice was weak, not at all the clear Midwestern tones that were spoken in 1969 and that we've heard and heard and heard ever since. But he said the words. And the audience stood up and the applause rained down and it was just the sweetest and finest and grandest thing you could ever hope to see. Space is out there. Let's go find it. Please join me for the first season of It's Your Universe, in which we'll explore the solar system, every week visiting one of our sun's planets, as well as the marble bag of colorful moons that circle so many of them. Join me next week when we visit Mercury and learn how a planet that has spent four and a half billion years getting roasted by the fires of the sun still figured out a way to hide ice on its surface. I'm Jeffrey Kluger, and this is Time Magazine's It's Your Universe, produced by Panoply.